A new class of monsters brought into the series in 4th gen, the amphibians are a small group of unusual monsters, with bodies somewhat resembling anurans, which is to say frogs and toads, but with other physical features strongly resembling other animals, the trio each have their own different niche within their biomes. Tetsukabra is in essence a huge tusked frog found in dank, humid environments. Zamtrios is the largest of the trio, a shark-like amphibian found in deserts and polar waterways. Tetranodon is an unusually beaked and shelled amphibian found anywhere with water to forage in. What's the purpose of the odd ornaments of the amphibians, and how do they survive in the broad array of habitats the family is found in? Let's dig in to find out. Starting with Tetsukabra, the most obvious point to begin with is the tusks, and how they may influence a lot of its behaviour and ecology. Whilst they may seem out of line for an anurin, multiple frogs actually have similar appendages, African bullfrogs have bony protrusions on the mandible for combat, and there's a whole family called fanged frogs especially for their tooth-like appendages. These are known as odontoids, and are part of the mandible bone itself, which fits with Tetsukabra whose carved descriptions claim the tusks are also part of the mandible too. So what may they be used for, and how can it apply to Tetsukabra? Frog fangs typically evolve independently of one another in various families, and two important factors are diet and fighting. It's also found that frogs with fangs for fighting typically had larger fangs, and that these were also more pronounced in the males. It's hard to imagine Tetsukabra having more pronounced tusks. So whilst they may play a multifunctional role, the initial cause of the evolutionary development could have been as weapons against other Tetsukabra. This may also suggest two things about Tetsukabra. One, much like a few other monsters, it could be that all the Tetsukabra we fight are males. Females may still have tusks, they may just not be as large. Considering male frogs can also be quite aggressive to anything intruding on their patch, this would also explain Tetsukabra's general hostility to the hunter and two, that drill tusk Tetsukabra, as I believe for a handful of other deviants, is actually just a prime condition male with a lot of testosterone that results in its exaggerated secondary sexual characteristics. Then there's diet, and indeed in-game information does claim that Tetsukabra's tusks are to help it forage. From the description, it does almost sound like it uses its tusks as a pig does its snout, rootling through the terrain in search of food. It's unknown if Tetsukabra exhibits much prey preference, but from this foraging plus the dank environments it inhabits, invertebrates of all shapes and sizes may well be a large chunk of its diet. This is also reflected in its mouth and teeth, which seem to be molar-like teeth adapted to crushing and giving it the means to easily process shelled prey. The tusks may also help with slippery prey as well, Burrowing microhylid frogs that eat primarily earthworms can often have surprisingly strong jaw muscles presumed to prevent the escape of their favoured prey. Tetsukabra's huge jaws and tusks could serve a similar function for anything slippery, and considering the environment, it may well occasionally go for kezu whelps. From behaviour we see in game, Tetsukabra doesn't seem to be a very fussy eater, and in its For You intro, it snaps up a pair of jaggy. As with many modern anurans, it may be a case of Tetsukabra will eat anything it can fit into its mouth. Fanged frogs that use them for predation are generally seen to take comparatively large and slash or resistant prey. And combining this with a possible lack of prey preference, Tetsukabra may well just shoot its shot at eating anything that looks reasonable in the environments it inhabits. Speaking of the environments it lives in, Tetsukabra may play some role in altering these for the purposes of breeding. Giant African bullfrogs are well known for their behaviours of digging channels in drying ephemeral water sources to protect their young from desiccation, with broods typically failing without the territorial males that do this. Tetsukabra may do something similar, and the stagnant pools of water in the sunken hollow may well be dug by Tetsukabra as breeding areas for their mates. It's mentioned Tetsukabra may prefer steeper terrain, and this may well be to locate sources of shallow running water like streams. 
Male tetsukabra may well then dig pits around such flowing water to create breeding pools for females. The huge tusks likely serve as excellent tools for digging, considering how successfully we see tetsukabra use them for this purpose in-game. And many anurans are successful burrowers too, even if they use their back legs over their mouths. Like Baroth and Almadron's ecosystem impacts, they could have notable effects on hydrology in the area, changing water flow and creating large deep ponds where before there were only shallow streams, would thus create new ecosystems for multitudes of life. The impact may not be quite the same, as Tetsukabra already live in what are likely reasonably well-watered environments in places like tropical forest and the sunken hollow. But the creation of new ponds can still be a significant boost to a lot of life, both larger and small. Once ponds are dug and the babies made, it's possible male Tetsukabra may still stick around to defend the young. Concept art does seem to show adults sticking around to look after the kids, and this is again something we see in male bullfrogs. They'll defend the young fiercely from predators, even at the cost of their own lives. And the protection of the adult males makes a significant difference in offspring survival. The bullfrogs deal with a lot of predators, and there are also a good number of significant threats to both the eggs and young of Tetsukabra in the humid environments that they dwell in, that could well wipe out a whole brood if unprotected. So it does seem like a good call for the adult male to stick around and defend his young. So with all that, a question may be that if Tetsukabra loves water so much, why doesn't he just go and live in the giant lakes and rivers seen across the world of Monster Hunter? And these habitats may well just be too risky for them. Tetsukabra are large, but likely not large enough to be immune from predation from aquatic giants like Lagiacrus and Plesioth, the latter especially often being found in inland freshwater environments. Tetsukabra trying to breed in large open water systems likely get picked off by Plesioth, and once the defending adults are gone, it's open season on the young. After all, canonically there are few things Plesioth loves more than frogs. It may be possible that they can survive in such areas in tributaries and smaller water sources, but unsustainable predation risk may prevent Tetsukabra from properly utilising large water bodies. Tetsukabra may again be like Baroth in that water is hugely important for it, but this doesn't necessarily mean it's a fully aquatic animal. After all, many toads are pretty poor swimmers, and some amphibians like rain frogs can actually drown, and they typically prefer much more arid areas. Another amphibian who prefers arid areas is Tiger Stripe Zamtrios. It may seem out of place for an amphibian to be in the desert, but anurans especially are well represented in arid environments with a number of features for their survival, including behavioural adaptations to get around a lack of water, with many becoming burrowers, and incredible tolerance to very high concentrations of their own bodily fluids. Two especially prevalent to tiger stripe Zamtrios may be water retention methods and the speed of maturity. Some frogs will coat their skin with a waxy substance made primarily of lipids, believed to help prevent water escaping from their permeable skin. Zamtrios is described as doing something similar, but to get ice to adhere to it for its armour, and with the mechanism in place it's not too big a stretch to turn this into a secretion to prevent water loss in tiger stripe Zamtrios. It's worth noting too that there don't seem to be any tiger stripe Zamites, and this may be another adaptation to desert life. Some desert amphibians like spadefoot toads have the ability to metamorphose from tadpoles to adults very quickly, and much earlier than other anurans in response to the water shortages of desert environments. Juvenile tiger stripes may skip the Zamite stage entirely and just become tiny versions of adult Zamtrios that live in the dunes and desert waterholes just as the adults do but on a much smaller scale. But perhaps the biggest question anyone may have for Zamtrios is what's with its ballooning stomach. In Pufferfish, this is a defensive mechanism, either making it unwieldy for the predator to swallow, or erecting its toxin-laden spines that are incredibly dangerous. In Zamtrios, this may have a similar function at least. Zamtrios are both large enough and able to take to the water that should allow them to escape from most threats in their range but polar giants like Yukonlos are still a big issue. Yukonlos's relatively small head and mouth may struggle to grab an expanded Zamtrios, 
but this is still a bit much for a feature for such a rare predator with massive ranges. So it could be that this is a function that's much more important in juvenile Zamites. Far smaller and much more vulnerable to the point where even a single Gaia prey could probably take one. The inflation response may actually be a far more important mechanism for the juveniles that face far more numerous threats both at land and sea. But it's worth asking, where does this behaviour actually come from? How does it even start? And what might this tell us? Well, in the overall pufferfish family, the origin of inflation comes from both their foraging and courtship displays. The fish would inhale water and then cough it out into the seabed, and this would unveil hidden prey. In some species, they use this ability to carve elaborate patterns into the seafloor to attract mates as a nest, such as the white-spotted pufferfish and triggerfish, and it advanced from coughing the water back out to a constant stream of it, which obviously required a greater holding capacity for it before finally becoming inflation. So what does all this mean for Zamtrios? Possibly that this behaviour is something it's moving away from, or reinforcement for the theory that this behaviour isn't especially prevalent in its adult life. Zamtrios can still cough up an ice slush, but this requires considerable effort with the mouth open, and with little accuracy. A look at Zamtrios's head and mouth shows that it's not well adapted to cough or water blow like a pufferfish. It lacks much of the muscular attachments and has a huge gape with no lips to reduce the aperture. In short, it almost certainly can't produce the small focused jets pufferfish and their relatives can, and so likely can't achieve the same precise functions. It may still have some overlap though. As a much bigger animal and much better adapted for macro predation, Zamtrios may use a less refined water coughing or blowing technique to forage for larger, hidden animals in the benthos and in estuarine zones, by simply blasting away great clouds of substrate. Sharks themselves also have sensory organs like the ampullae of Lorenzini to help them find hidden animals in sediment. So if Zamtrios is similar, it may well be well suited to foraging on the seafloor and in silty environments. But what about the juvenile form too, known as Zamites? In game, they're notorious for latching onto the player and draining their blood, taking incredibly large meals in the process. And concept art shows Zamites using these techniques to drill into large carcasses to feed on the insides too. As well as scavenging, it could be possible that this tick-like behaviour is how Zamites both feed and disperse. Zamites could engage in similar behaviours on whales. And as mentioned in past videos, it does seem that whales exist in the world of Monster Hunter, being known as Arlok. Zamites may cling to their giant hosts, feeding off them and benefiting from the warmth of their body in the polar waters, and letting them carry them to new areas to keep healthy gene flow going. The horn-like appendage on the Zamites may even be to reduce drag whilst on the hosts, and modern remoras show similar tactics in deliberately selecting low drag areas on their targets. This may also explain the ballooning ability of Zamtrios. During the ride or prior to detaching, they may fill themselves with blood as a final large meal to keep them going once they're free. A similar but less benign marine organism is the cookie-cutter shark, a tiny animal known for taking big circular bites out of larger animals. Often whales or other cetaceans, but sometimes fish and even humans. If Zamtrios doesn't cling to large hosts for long periods, then they may still tear the occasional chunk out of them when the opportunity presents itself. Unlike the specialised jaws of the cookie cutter, they use a drill-like horn and death rolls to tear pieces free. The final amphibian is Tetranodon. Almost serving as a halfway point between Zamtrios and Tetsukabra, it can also inflate but not to the same extent. As well as its distensible stomach, Tetranodon may also eat rocks, and it's possible these behaviours all blend together with its unique bill with how the Tetranodon forages. Some animals will swallow rocks, known as gastroliths, seemingly on purpose. The reason for this isn't entirely known. But the prevailing theory is that it's for buoyancy control, principally to help an animal sink. And this makes sense for Tetranodon. It's primarily a bottom-feeding animal, sifting through rocks and silt in search of goo cumbers and other aquatic invertebrates mainly, but also anything it believes it can fit into its mouth regardless of digestibility. 
An animal spending long periods of time on the floors of water bodies would need buoyancy control, so it isn't constantly burning energy and oxygen, fighting its own buoyancy to stay submerged, as well as helping it resist the current of running water too. What started as possibly an accidental behaviour due to Tetranodon's relatively reckless and imprecise methods of feeding, ultimately evolved to become a deliberate one to help it stay underwater for long periods of time. Gastroliths were once suggested to help sauropod dinosaurs digest their food as well. And whilst this may have fallen out of favour in recent times, it may well be the case for Tetranodon, as well as linking with its ability to partially inflate. Pufferfish have sacrificed the digestive ability of their stomach in favour of its ability to expand greatly with alkaline seawater. And Tetranodon may have done the same. A mix of seawater or alkaline rocks, or just diluting the stomach acid so frequently, may have rendered Tetranodon's stomach somewhat useless for digestion. So instead it uses the rocks to help grind up its prey. This is also supported by Tetranodon having a duck-like beak, and likely to generate large forces necessary for extensive mechanical digestion. Considering invertebrates may well be a large part of its diet too, Tetranodon may need digestive aids to help break them up. This may not be universal among amphibians though, as other marine organisms with similar inflation abilities actually still have functioning stomachs so this may not necessarily be a sacrifice Zamtrios also has to make. The final part of Tetranodon's unique foraging setup is of course its bill. If this is anything like the bill of the platypus, it's quite a unique organ. Platypus bills are incredibly sensitive and specialised and even are capable of electroreception, detecting the movements of its prey by minuscule electrical signals in their muscle tissues allowing them to easily find prey in murky water where sight is less important. Again, for something that forages in either murky water itself, or something that will naturally kick up a lot of silt as it feeds, it does seem like Tetranodon has a similarly sensitive bill to help it dabble along the lake and estuary floors. It may even combine this with the water blowing of pufferfish. Its beak is described as being able to fire out water too and this would only help with further uncovering prey as sight likely isn't really important for Tetranodon when foraging. This may also lead to its seemingly reckless behaviour when trying to feed. Tetranodon may have very poor eyesight, and just try to snap at anything it picks up on the electrical signals of, including stray humans and even fanged beasts. For my thoughts on where the amphibians lie, they're a bit of a mixed bag for me. I really like Tetsukabra, I think he's got a great design as a heavily exaggerated frog, and he's a decent enough early game fight. I think he's got a lot of potential if brought back in a world type game for environmental interactions. I think it'd be really nice to see them digging and maintaining a pond for their young like bullfrogs, as well as having an intraspecific turf war like Diablos. Having baby Tetsu be capturable endemic life would also be nice, at the cost of the adult male enraging if you so much as touch one and pursuing you across the map. I think it'd be nice if you could also use him as an environmental trap because of his willingness to defend his young against any threat. Overall, I think there's already a lot to like, and a lot of potential for the future as well. He's definitely my favourite of the amphibians. I think Zamtrios is something of a muddled monster though. He feels like so many gimmicks stuffed into one monster rather than a single clear idea. He's trying to be a frog, shark, balloon, and icicle all at once, and they all clash. I feel if they leaned more into one side, he'd feel like a much more focused design. Have him be more like the Zamite, and then double down on the ice armor. Have a sharp, sleek shark that gets sharper and sleeker as it coats itself in ice. The balloon aspect just feels a bit tonally off for Zamtrios, for me at least. And when Beatodus arrived in Iceborne, I really found he filled the niche of Snow Shark better for me. I do think without the ice covering ability though, that Tiger Stripe Zamtrios does fit the desert quite well and feels like the more focused monster. It is a crime neither Zamtrios nor Tetsu weren't in Sunrise though, considering their kids were. I also think fighting Zamtrios underwater could potentially be an interesting aspect that could bring a lot to him as a fight and a monster, who knows. Tetranodon, as I've said before, feels like it has a bit of a similar problem. Too many unrelated ideas clashing in a single monster. Kappa, sumo wrestler, frog, turtle, platypus. I really think the sumo aspect would serve another monster better than Tetranodon. 
He's just so low ranking he doesn't feel like this massive strong glacier of a monster, as a sumo should be. Similarly, the Kappa aspect only really feels mildly aesthetic. But then with what Kappas do in the folklore, it's probably for the best. It gets pretty R-rated. Not actually sure they were the best choice for the goofy anime vibe of Rise. It's interesting as the first turtle monster though, and that's as good a family as any to base future monsters on. Shellless turtles are wonderfully weird, and alligator snapping turtles already look so monstrous, all they need is a 30 times size increase, and they'll both be willing and able to solo half the elders. It's also good to see the person on the design team who really wanted a platypus monster finally got their wish too. Overall, Tetranodon isn't a bad monster, but he really doesn't stick out as a favourite of mine either. I do think the amphibian class as a whole has some good potential though, even more so if water combat returns. Some of the concept art looks pretty cool too, and could make for good bases for future monsters. As ever, I'm keen to see what the future holds. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and haven't already, consider liking, subscribing, and sharing it with others who may also be interested. A huge thanks too to all of the patrons supporting the channel, and especially to Erengar Steiny for their generosity. If you're interested in supporting the channel too, then there's a link in the description to the Patreon, and I appreciate any help you feel you can give. Another thanks to I Am The Kaiju King as well for providing the skulls for this video. As ever, be sure to check out his Tumblr for his other content too. And thanks to Freaky Owl as well and Carmen Rider Moten for delivering the images necessary to make the skulls. To address some of the comments from last time, one thing that was brought up a lot was elemental weakness and resistances. Nursilla is weak to thunder, whereas Kezu and Gypsros are pretty resistant to it. It's hard to say exactly how canon elemental weaknesses are. Some are clearly canon, like some monsters being more susceptible to poison than others, and some just make sense, like Kezu not handling fire very well. But a lot don't really make sense. Why does Red Kezu have an aversion to water and not fire when all he has is a little bit of extra pigment? So there's some evidence that Nursilla may protect itself from thunder, but it's hard to say if this was intentional or not. There was also the theory of Nursilla's corpse camouflage possibly helping it in hunting. Whilst Gypsaros's eyes are likely too good for it, the blind Kezu may well be attracted to the smell of rotting meat, and it may function as an olfactory lure to bring the otherwise sedentary Kezu closer for an attack, or at least to goad it into revealing its position. Dawn Tyrant Eo also pointed out Nursilla's habit of hanging its kills around its home, and how many spider mating rituals often include gift giving of food parcels to one another. So rather than a single Nursilla's larder, the hung up kills may be nuptial gifts, with the sunken hollow being something of a Nursilla love nest. Also, the thumbnail was a reference to the classic B-movie Eight-Legged Freaks, and yet only one person got it. Hoping at least some of you know what Futurama is. Anyway, the next video was decided by my patrons too. So for next time, 